to be here with you. Um, hope that you're doing well. And uh, a welcome to all of you as we gather to worship our God. A uh, couple of things I want to mention announcement-wise, just a heads up that um, we will be having our Ash Wednesday service uh, to mark the beginning of Lent on March 2nd. That's not this coming Wednesday, but a week from Wednesday. Here in the sanctuary at 6.30, our Ash Wednesday service. You're all welcome to come and be a part of that. Um, we would call your attention to the prayer list and ask that you remember all of these folks in your prayers. Other than that, it, it's all printed there, so uh, please read it as uh, you have time to do that. Are there other announcements? Anything for anyone to share? Okay. I do need to share with you that since the last time we gathered here in our sanctuary for worship last Sunday, uh, our church family has been uh, diminished by the death of, of two people. Uh, Rosalie Jurison passed away this past Thursday, February 17, and uh, Dave Thomas died yesterday morning. So um, we want to keep uh, these families and all in our prayers. We do have arrangements for for Rosalie's memorial service. It will be here at the church on this coming Saturday, uh, the 26th at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock this coming Saturday, uh, followed by a visitation and a reception in the fellowship hall. Um, arrangements for Dave's, Dave Thomas's service, they're incomplete at this time, So, but we'll send out information about that as, as soon as that's available. Apostle Paul wrote that we should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So as is our custom, I want to ask that we pause now for a moment of prayer for uh, Rosalie's and Dave's loved ones and families and friends so that through our prayers we can help them uh, as they bear their burden of grief at this time. So as you're able, please stand for prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you are the God of the resurrection. You raise Christ Jesus from the dead, and you raise your people. We give you thanks for the life of Rosalie Jurison. We thank you for the life of Dave Thomas. We pray now that you would be near to their loved ones and family and close friends in their grief. In particular, we pray for Rosalie's daughter and son-in-law, Jenny and Mike Riley. We pray for Dave's wife, Joanne. We ask you, O oh God, to comfort them. We ask you to support them and draw them close to you and close to one another. We ask you to fill their eyes with the light of your promises so that they will be able to see beyond human sight the home within your love where pain is gone and where frail flesh turns to glory. Banish all fear, O God, and wipe away painful tears and let their grieving be for their healing. And may their hope and our hope be fixed upon Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So again, a welcome to all of you. Uh, we have a special treat planned for today's prelude.
Worship God. As you're able, please stand now for our responsive call to worship. The Spirit of God calls to us with sighs too deep for words. The Spirit of God speaks within us, claiming us, inviting us to draw close. The Spirit of God calls us by name. Let us answer the Spirit's call. Let us worship God.
Let us pray. Lord God, you are with us wherever we are. We give you thanks for your abiding presence. And we praise you for you have the whole world in your hands. There's nothing outside your care. You know us, each one by name and each one by need. So here and now we offer our lives in thanks and gratitude. And with courage and full assurance of your love, we worship you, our God, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Now let's join with one another in a time of honesty before God. In humility and faith, let us open our hearts to God. Lord, there are some things we cannot do over. Yesterday is gone. And for those parts of yesterday that are final and unchangeable, give us the willingness to accept what is over. For errors or evil on our part, we are sorry. Keep us from rejecting your forgiveness. You have said, whoever will, let that person come to you. And here we are, asking to be let in where the light of your love shines, where the splendor of your mercy surrounds, renews, and gives peace. Gracious Lord, as the new morning dawns, clothe us in your light and go with us through the day so we may walk in the confidence of your love. of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Christ Jesus, we are, we always have been, and we always will be forgiven. May the God of mercy strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep us in eternal life. Amen.
the children to come back up here for the children's sermon. <laughs> a great song y'all did thank you and ringing the bells i like that that was nice how's everybody doing good, good? okay um i have a question for you is there anything that you're afraid of does anything scare you yeah what what kind of things scare you what are you afraid of what the ocean, the ocean. The deep ocean, not all the ocean, just the deep ocean. Yeah, okay, yeah. All right, else. What are, what are the kind of things are you afraid of? The, you, dark. the dark? Yeah, a lot of people are afraid of the dark. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. You afraid of the dark? What else? Cortland, you afraid of anything? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, everybody's probably afraid of something, don't you think? You know, and and uh, heights. I am. I am afraid of heights. Yes, I'm one of the. All right, sharks. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely scared of sharks. Yeah, that's right. But heights. I'm one of those people. I don't like heights. You know. Yeah. But you know, everybody's afraid of something, including grown-ups. Okay grown-ups too and um, so that's just a part of life there's always it seems like there's always something that we're we're frightened by or scared of or you know uh, worried about and what do you do when you're afraid of something how do you how do you get past your your fear what do you do well when i'm scared when i'm in my room and i'm scared of the dark me and my mom we bought some early lights for my room and those light up my room Okay. And I also go into the and Okay, right, right. So your mom helps you because you have some lights in your room. Okay. And I bet just having your mom in there with you helps a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. It's a lot easier to face our fears when we're not by ourselves, right? Does that make sense? If you have somebody with you? Well, that's what I wanted to tell you is that even if no matter where you are, you know, because you, your, your mom or your dad might not always be right there, but you know, God is. Okay. God's always with you. And there's always always going to be things that will frighten us even when you grow up it's just that's part of life okay but that doesn't mean that we have to go through those things by ourselves all right that God is always there and God loves you and you just sang about it a minute ago you said Jesus loves me that's you know that's because well that's why we don't have to I mean we're always going to be afraid but we're not going through it by ourselves and that that helps a lot it's always good to know if somebody's there with you and even when if there's not a person with you God's always always there with you okay I hope you'll remember that anytime you're afraid of something you can always pray to God to help Help you and that's what we're going to do right now okay so will you pray with me all right dear God whenever we're afraid when things frighten us or scare us help us to stop and remember that you are with us and that you love us and we can trust you in all things in Jesus name we pray amen thanks
And we know that fear is contagious, right? We've all experienced how fear passes among us and how it spreads from one issue to another and one person or one group to another and, and it escalates and consumes us and it pumps up our negative adrenaline and it conjures up our worst selves and it skews our vision and it distorts our better judgment. And it saps the joy and the meaning out of life. It seems to me that we live in a particularly fearful time right now. Lots of things to fear. But then, there is God. There is fear. And there is God. Most of you know that a number of times over the years I've gone on a spiritual retreat at a Travis Monastery outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And I've shared with you about the flow of the day at the monastery and how uh, the life of a Travis monk just chanting psalms from the Bible at seven different prayer services throughout the day. And the first of these prayer services is called Vigils, and it's at 4 o'clock in the morning. And then the final prayer service of the day, which is called Compline, starts at 8 o'clock in the evening. Compline is a very special, beautiful service, I think, there in the church, I mean, the, the monastery church sanctuary. Compline takes place in the dark. There's no lights on. And by that time of day, it is dark. And the liturgy that is used for Compline is the same every night. It doesn't change. In the other services, it changes. The Compline is the same every night of the year. And it's done entirely from memory, which works out because it's dark anyway. You wouldn't be able to read something if it were in front of you. But it's done from memory. And one of the Compline Psalms is Psalm 91, which I'm going to read to you in just a moment. But I want you to, to uh, picture in your imagination this beautiful monastery church sanctuary and monks in a quiet, dark sanctuary dressed in their monastic robes and their eyes are closed solemnly, slowly, softly chanting these words. Psalm 91. You, who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For God will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. God will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. God's faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the Most High your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no, no scourge come near your tents. For God will command the angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. They call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them show them my salvation. You will not fear the terror of the night, or the arrow that flies. 
last five days, the psalmist promises. Nor will you fear the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes the noonday. You will not fear. That's what the psalmist says. You know, fear is a major topic in the Bible. Fear is mentioned in Scripture over 300 times. Lots of fear in the Bible. But then, there's God. A God who says, fear not. There's a fellow you may have heard of, Walter Brueggemann. Walter Brueggemann is probably the finest Old Testament scholar alive today. I read a story about how he was once about to give a lecture to a large crowd of people. And as you might imagine, everybody in the audience was, was uh, excited and, and expecting a, a really scholarly dissertation on some challenging topic. And they sat ready and alert and they had their pencils and pens in their hands and they were ready to take notes and they were expecting this really, really powerful uh, technical academic lecture. To their surprise, Ruben and I began his talk by asking everybody to put their pens and pencils down. And he said, I'd like to ask you to recall a time when you were a young child. A time when, as a young child, you were frightened. A time when maybe uh, you were lying in bed at night and you were convinced that the shadows on the bedroom wall were out of a burglar at the window, or a monster, or maybe the, the sound of the wind outside blowing outside was, was some sort of warning of something horrible that was about to happen. Just think of a time when you were frightened, when you called out in fear, in the darkness you called out in fear to your mother or your father, who finally appeared and took you in his or her arms and said, it's okay. Everything's all right. I'm here. Don't be afraid. And then this world-renowned biblical scholar said that is the fundamental, primary, consistent message of the Bible. I'm here. Don't be afraid. When all is said and done, that is the core. That is the essence of Psalm 91, and it is the core and the essence of the entire biblical message. I am here. Don't be afraid. Now we're all born with fears, I think. And that's not all bad. I think some fears serve as well. We have a built-in fear of falling, for instance. I have a highly developed fear of falling, so that goes along with fear of life, fear of life. Fear can be a wake-up call. It can, uh, it can alert you to danger. It can put you on high alert. And depending on the situation, that can be good. On the other hand, though, our fears can, can have the opposite result. Fear can overwhelm you. It can decrease your alerts. Extreme fear can make it impossible to focus on anything other than the object of the fear. Fear can take over our lives. Have you ever thought about how powerful a motivator fear can be? I think fear is certainly a dominant factor in our economy. Fear sells. Fear can sell security systems and car alarms. Fear can motivate people to buy guns. Fear can convince you that you have to have the new super powerful vitamin or that, that miracle herbal supplement. You know, think of the ways that fear sells. Fear can also be like a prison, a personal prison, a prison that oppresses you and limits you and, and confines you keeps you from living a full life. For instance, fear of failing can convince people not to try anything new. Fear of failing can convince people not to do anything that is even mildly risky. I 
think fear of humiliation is another thing. Fear of humiliation can, can stifle students in the classroom from raising their hand. Fear of ridicule can keep you from speaking your mind. Fear can keep you confined in one place, one place where you never risk, where you never stretch, where you never reach. And fear of rejection prevents us from saying, I love you. I need you. I want you. Fear of rejection keep us from expressing ourselves in that way. Somebody once said that if Michelangelo had been afraid of heights, he would have painted the Sistine Chapel floor instead of the city. <laughs> but that's how it works, isn't it? That's how fear, that's what fear does to us. It can become our own personal prison. Now today, 